So we are opening our session with uh, Peter Staudenmeier that will talk about uh, From Fascist Italy to the Alt-Right, Julius Evola and the Revival of Radical Antisemitism. Please. Thank you, Manuela. I'm going to stand, even though I have nothing to show you. So I came up with an opening anecdote that I hope will connect up a little bit with the other two presentations. Uh, a little over two years ago right now, in January 2017, a new radical right website was launched. It's called outright.com. You shouldn't, but you go, could go look at it right now if you really wanted to. Uh, it was founded by Richard Spencer, who Linda mentioned uh, this morning. Spencer is sort of the foremost public face of this weird thing that we're all still calling the alt-right for some reason, which Linda described aptly as, what do you call it, a loose assemblage, I think? Of, something like that. A loose assemblage of uh, radical right elements. And this website, altright.com, was meant to be the primary online source for that loose assemblage, which, by the way, in early 2017 was experiencing a rapid rise in notoriety and popularity. For its first several months of operation, the website opened on a picture of none other than Julius Evola, the guy that I'm going to be talking about for the next 20 minutes. And at first glance, that might seem puzzling, because why would a guy who died in 1974, that's when Evola passed away, why would he be the primary point of reference for a movement that is filled with people who weren't even born in 1974? But for those who follow the far right, for those who keep tabs on the radical right, it's actually not that much of a surprise. Evola has become an absolutely iconic figure for the ongoing revival of the radical right in North America, in Europe, and elsewhere as well, both for the younger and the older generations of that revival. Julius Evola was also, not coincidentally, an extremely prolific anti-Semitic propagandist during the fascist era prior to 1945. In fact, I would argue that Evola was among the most influential anti-Semitic intellectuals in 20th century Europe, even if scholarship is only recently catching up with him. However, the problem at the heart of my presentation this afternoon is the gap between those two aspects of Evola's legacy, on the one hand, his iconic status among a very wide swath of the radical right, and on the other hand, the often neglected concrete details of his anti-Semitic theories, of the teachings that he actually promulgated during the 1930s and 1940s. Those theories, his anti-Semitic teachings, were complex. They were an unusually sophisticated version of anti-Semitic ideology. But to a large extent, his own followers and admirers have either overlooked those theories, misunderstood them, distorted them, or ignored them entirely. And at the end of my presentation, I'll try to offer a couple of quick potential explanations for that conspicuous discrepancy. So who was Julius Evola? He was born in Rome in 1898, died in 1974, as I said a minute ago. And he came to prominence during the fascist era for two intertwined reasons. One was his harsh criticism of what we might call the mainstream of the fascist movement. In Evola's eyes, Mussolini's regime was often much too willing to compromise. It wasn't nearly intransigent enough, in his words. It wasn't radical enough. You might say it wasn't fascist enough for him. The second reason was Evola's outspoken promotion of racism and anti-Semitism long before, years before, those things became standard facets of Italian fascism. And in the 1930s, those stances often enough put Evola, uh, got him in trouble with various fascist authorities. One of the most interesting archival findings that I've come across in the course of my research on him is the voluminous correspondence that was generated by his repeated attempts to join the fascist party. He applied multiple times and was turned down each time. Basically, the short version is he had made too many enemies within the fascist hierarchy. Interestingly enough, Evola sometimes fared better in his northern neighbor, Nazi Germany. He had extensive contacts with the German right both before and after Hitler came to power in 1933. He was fluent in German. He wrote very elegant, very erudite German, published frequently uh, in German. And in the late 1930s and early 1940s, he conduct conducted a series of pretty lengthy speaking tours all across 
the Third Reich, and he often spoke, during those speaking tours, he often spoke explicitly on racial topics. A number of his talks received very positive coverage in the Nazi press. Last but not least, Evola collaborated directly with the SS on a wide variety of projects during the same time period. He was a particular admirer of the SS, as critical as he was of other aspects of both Italian fascism and of German National Socialism. When it came to the SS, he saw them as closer to his model of a truly fascist order. Back home in Italy, Evola's, Evola's major opportunity came in 1941 when Mussolini decided, for complicated historical reasons, to make Evola's anti-Semitic theories the more or less quasi-official racial doctrine of the fascist regime. Now that did not last all that long, but 1941 is a pretty crucial time period for that to be the case. When the Allies entered Rome in 1944, Evola fled back north, fled back to Nazi Germany. He spent the last year of the war there, working once again with the SS. Now that only gets us to 1945, and it's already a fairly eventful fascist career for <coughs> one person for one lifetime. But it's actually after 1945 that Evola became an even more important figure for European fascist circles. From the late 1940s onward, he was a sort of spiritual mentor for a group of younger neo-fascist militants, several of whom were involved in various right-wing terrorist attacks in Italy. But the failure of the Axis powers in World War II, the fact that fascist Italy and Nazi Germany lost the war instead of winning, as Evola expected and hoped, that fact required some serious adjustments <coughs> to Evola's image in the post-war context. So he, along with his followers, refashioned himself as a kind of nonconformist who stood aloof from petty political concerns. And, along with his followers, he downplayed, or often enough flatly denied, his involvement in the anti-Semitic campaign in the 1930s and 1940s. And that is one of the long-standing myths that the post-war Evola cultivated around himself. And it isn't particularly difficult to puncture that myth. All you have to do is go back and look at the enormous flood of publications that he authored in the 1930s and the 1940s on what he called, quote, the Jewish problem, end quote. That was Evola's preferred term for this topic. Just between 1936 and 1941, just in that five-year period, Evola wrote four book-length treatises on that topic, along with dozens of lengthy, substantial articles and countless smaller pieces as well. Tellingly, virtually none of this material has been translated into English. It's almost all just available in Italian. A little bit more is available uh, in German. In 1937, he co-published the Italian edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion wrote a lengthy commentary to the text to accompany the publication. And the stance that he took there was distinctive. I'm going to spare you the details of his weird outlook on the protocols. But in general, Evola vehemently opposed what he saw as piecemeal approaches to the ostensible Jewish problem. And he demanded instead what he called a totalitarian racism. Quote, totalitarian racism, end quote. That's one of several striking phrases that Evola coined which he hoped would eliminate the Jewish threat once and for all and prevent any further corruption of the Aryan race, as he termed it. Evola especially prided himself on offering a spiritual conception of racism. This is one of the most important facets of his thought. Manuela right now is working on a book about exactly this topic, which I'm extremely excited about. There is not nearly enough scholarly material available in this part of Evola in English, so he prided himself on offering a spiritual conception of racism. What he meant was, in distinction from what he considered merely biological forms of racism, which in, her, which in his view were basically just not up to the task of rooting out every last trace of Jewish contamination within Western culture. Despite that spiritual emphasis, however, Evola regularly referred to blood as the expression of racial identity, and he sometimes used decidedly biological metaphors in his anti-Semitic works. As one example, as early as 1936, that is two full years before the fascist regime officially adopted an anti-Semitic policy. As early as 1936, Evola warned against, quote, the Jewish virus, 
end quote, another coinage of his. <laughs> Not that he was the first one to coin that term, but he warned against, quote, the Jewish virus, uh, and was sort of hoping that it could somehow be stopped from further infecting European society. There are historical forms of anti-Semitism that effectively function, I would say, as a stand-in for forms of social discontent of various kinds. I'm sure that at least some of you in the audience are familiar with Shulamit Volkov's notion of anti-Semitism as a cultural code. If you're not, that is a, an essay worth grappling with. It's about 40 years old now, but uh, go look it up. The basic idea there, too, simplify, too simplified, is that in particular historical moments, in particular places, in particular times, anti-Semitism can sometimes serve as a vehicle for other kinds of discontent with the prevailing social order, with whatever forms of social dislocation are going on. For what it's worth, with Evola, it was essentially the other way around. What he did was erect an extraordinarily elaborate analysis of the entire modern world in its myriad manifestations, all of it based squarely on Jews. For Evola, the Jews embodied all of the destructive forces of modernity. And modernity, in turn, for Evola, represented the great enemy, period, end of sentence. That is why the Jewish threat, in his eyes, had to be combated ruthlessly and uncompromisingly. Now that was a much too brief and too condensed uh, summary of his racial and anti-Semitic teachings, but I think it gives us a sense of the appeal that Evola continues to hold for the radical right today. The alt-right in the US and elsewhere, the so-called alt-right, is busily constructing its own full-fledged critique of modernity right now, once again placing Jews at the center of everything they think is wrong with the world. And Evola is a hero for this younger generation of the radical right. But that isn't really a new development. For what it's worth, Evola's stature has been rising on the right for four decades now, virtually since his death, since the 1970s. In fact, if anything, the more recent Evola Renaissance and the North American far right, which is really only about four years old, give or take, if anything, his influence on people like Richard Spencer, I mentioned before, people like uh, Greg Johnson, the founder of Countercurrents, publishing and website, etc., if anything, that North American recent Evola Renaissance, that's comparatively new, but in the rest of the world, he has been an established figure in the pantheon of far-right thinkers for a pretty long time. Evola was a foundational influence on the French New Right, for example, a foundational influence on Alexander Dugan in Russia, very important influence on the extreme right in places like Argentina, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. What we don't see for the most part, at least not yet, what we don't see for the most part is an extensive or detailed reception of Evola's anti-Semitic theories specifically. And I mean here a detailed extensive reception by the latter-day radical right of, anti of Evola's anti-Semitic teachings. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but they are notably vague and general. But that's how anti-Semitic thinking works. It is built on a vague associational logic that won't stand up to detailed scrutiny. It is full of unclear and indefinite but very passionate ideological commitments. Nonetheless, I think that this selective appropriation of Evola's thought can tell us something important about the deeply conflicted relationship of the current radical right with the classical fascist era prior to 1945. That is what the mythical image of Evola offers to people like the alt-right. If you don't look too closely, he seems like a figure who offers a connection to the past, a connection to your own forebears, if you will, but who is supposedly untainted by the failures of the past. And I think that dynamic is really crucial to understanding the, a characteristic aspect of today's so-called alt-right. They simultaneously long for historical continuity, but they fear historical culpability. And I think it behooves us, it would be good for scholars who study this sort of thing, to try to 
uh, give some further consideration to that weird dynamic. At the same time, yearning for historical continuity, but trying to evade any notion of historical culpability. Okay, what have we got? A few minutes left? I won't even need all five. I want to conclude with some brief reflections on how scholars specifically, of whatever discipline, I happen to be a historian, but this, to my mind, this applies across the board, I want to conclude with some brief reflections on the ways that scholars can help to illuminate obscure subjects like this. Evola is an exceedingly obscure subject. Trying to read his work is a challenge. It's a, it's a real trudge. My own view, despite that, my own view is that I think we need to take the seemingly marginal elements in the contemporary revival of the radical right, the seeming, seemingly marginal elements in far-right anti-Semitism, whether those elements are historical, from 70 or 80 years ago, or whether they're happening right now around us, I think we need to take those seemingly marginal elements seriously because they can re-emerge in unexpected ways. They can re-emerge in ways that we don't see coming beforehand. I recognize that in the wake of Christchurch, in the wake of Pittsburgh, it is really hard to use the patient and deliberative tools of scholarly analysis to try to make sense of this revival of radical anti-Semitism. I realize that that is a hard thing to do. Trying to make sense of any aspect of the current radical right is hard, simply because the, the object of your study is constantly morphing and evolving in front of your eyes. It's equally hard to make sense of its anti-Semitic obsessions. Often enough, after things like Pittsburgh, after things like Christchurch, our initial instinct, understandably, is usually more a form of revulsion and dismissal. But I think we have an obligation to try to resist that instinct as much as possible and to do our best to use the scholarly forums and the scholarly positions and the scholarly uh, speaking opportunities and writing opportunities that we have. I think we need to do our best to try to further public understanding of an ethically challenging topic and a politically challenging topic. And my hope is that Closer critical attention to figures like Evola can make an important difference toward that goal. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion.